Uh, but, but we spend enough time on the positive end of things. Let's flip that coin and look at the other end of it. What, is there something that you're really afraid of? Or in other words, what's the worst case scenario? What's the potential nightmare result of your work? Nightmare result of my work or nightmare result in general of what might happen in the future? Or in general. Well, you can take both if you want. I guess we could look at both, yeah. Um, let me just look at the general one first, which is um, really comes back to that issue I was talking about, about meeting new challenges. My main worry is that um, either we're going to go through a period of turmoil where the economies in the world and uh, the way things work just don't work as effectively anymore as they have done for the most recent time. So that, for instance, just organizing the kind of infrastructure that you need to do futuristic work, to do these kinds of large-scale projects, becomes impossible. So I'm worried that we might be on a limited timer here for getting these sort of things done because I don't know exactly where things are heading in the, in the world at large. It's always, you know, it's a, we don't know exactly. So you that's one of the things that... Speaking. Uh, politically speaking and, and yeah and therefore the sort of fallout that you can get from political yeah. issues um, the other one is that uh, yeah that, that that the environment in front of us that the kinds of challenges we're going to meet there just in terms of something that happens to the environment we live in mm -hmm. or something that happens because of other technology that we develop such as artificial intelligence or nanotechnology just to name a few or biotechnology, think of you know, biological weapons and such, mm -hmm. might make the environment unlivable for us or might make it so difficult to live in it that all we can do is barely scrape by trying to survive without really dealing with bigger problems and possibilities and opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I worry that we might be causing such issues ourselves or that something like that may come towards us. So I feel a certain urgency or desire for haste to try to do things that will allow us the kind of adaptability and the kind of security and backup and possibilities that that go beyond that. So that's one of my bigger general worries and that's really why why I do this. Um, well besides of course the you know just the desire for more capabilities and basically what I used to tall, call uh, wanting to be able to understand everything and, and create anything, which is not something you ever achieve, but it's something you like being on a path towards. Now, in terms of the kind of nightmare scenarios I think of uh, from my work, if it were done badly or if someone were not paying attention to problems, uh, I think that they're kind of along the same lines as, as what we worry about with a lot of information technology today, which is who owns it, what are they allowed to do with it, um, who's influencing it or changing it even when you don't want it to be changed or written that way so how do you make sure that you stay you have some sort of uh, um, personal in chargeness about your own information like we want to have about our DNA and you'd like to have that as well in terms of your, your mind you want to you have you know, essentially some sort of barrier where you can say okay I permit this I don't permit this that's the kind of thing I do worry about and also, of course, that someone may take um, insights that we gather while we're working in this direction and use them badly. Let's say to use them to create something that is meant only as a, I don't know, some sort of artificial intelligence um, AI warfare thing that they use maybe for intelligence gathering or something like that. And I wouldn't want it to become something that is associated with those sorts of uh, issues but also I wouldn't want to have to deal with it as a um, sort of an arms race where you try to constantly stay ahead of uh, of these possible negative outcomes so my preference would be to try to uh, predict as much as we can where where lie the dangers so what sort of information do you need to pr protect and how how do you make sure that there is uh, you, that you have what do you call these things now it's like um, the controls like you know, that you have on your personal uh, privacy and stuff like that, and and similarly that we um, that we understand a bit about all the rest of the technologies that are being developed around us and how these may interact. It's dangerous to think of one technology as developing in isolation. 
as if it's on an island. And that's the only thing that's going to happen and then predict the future is going to be like this because that's the technology we'll have. There's all this other stuff going on around it. I mean, if you're building the kind of technology to do this data acquisition for whole brain emulation, what if you use the same sort of technology for something completely different, like some nanotech approach or something with AI? But that's my biggest, that's my biggest concern is that what we're talking about here would have radical implications. Legal, religious, ethical, political, spiritual, you name it, it would change everything, right? Yeah. What about unintended consequences and especially in the narrow personal responsibility sense? Do you not ever have nightmares of you uh, playing the role of Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein? I do worry. I worry about possible negative outcomes. The, but this is why I said, okay, are you looking at my worries in the general picture or my worries about how things may turn out with the work? Because you have to balance the two. Saying, I'm worried that something bad may happen because of what I do and therefore I won't do it is not the cure-all to all problems because A, the status quo isn't necessarily fine. It's not safe. It doesn't mean everything's going to be okay. And, it's, and B, if I don't do it, who says someone else won't? And if I'm the one who's worrying about the potential negative outcomes, then maybe I should be doing it, because at least I'm taking that into consideration. So that's my view. When I think, should I be doing this, I'm taking those things into consideration. I'm saying, okay, at least I will worry about those problems, and also I see this as a potential way of guarding against other challenges that are coming our way because as I said this is not happening in isolation all the other technologies are still going to be developed people are going to work on nanotechnology people are going to work on artificial intelligence this is not going to stop just if you don't do whole brain emulation the only thing you get by doing sim is that you give us a chance to keep up with all that other stuff you give us a, us a chance to to choose to participate in getting new capabilities and being able to safeguard some of what we are. So what's the relationship between mind uploading and the general concept of the technological singularity? Where does mind uploading fit within it, in your opinion? Uh, that's a really tough question and I tried to address that a little bit in the piece that I wrote for the singularity hypothesis for that book. And I think that it's uh, to me where it fits in the singularity is us not being a bystander who sees the singularity happen and then just take off and, and we're left behind basically still communicating the way we do now and understanding things as we do now but not being able to understand what those other intelligences perhaps that we've created are talking about and interested in because that's just way beyond us so it's about participating rather than standing by for me, that's where SIM fits into the singularity. Although I myself have some issues with the term singularity because it seems like it gives this idea that overnight suddenly there's going to be enormous changes and uh, we won't be able to predict what's going on. And that, you know, it's there's something about that that could happen, sort of possible and plausible, and there are several authors also in that book that describe that. But then there are many other scenarios, and we have to remember that we're, we're talking about a universe with physical laws, so everything has resource requirements, which means that a sudden overnight takeoff that leaves us all in the dust is kind of unlikely because how fast can you reorganize all those physical resources? So I have some issues with the concept of the singularity as this sort of actual singularity, this takeoff phenomenon that at some point becomes just really 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 fast. So but, you think it's more likely to be what Werner Vinge calls soft takeoff rather than a hard takeoff? Yeah I'm kind of more of a soft takeoff person because I, I think this there you run into some physical limits there in terms of how the rate at which you can keep changing stuff. Mm -hmm. Now if you were just a bystander then at some point it might begin to seem like a hard takeoff situation because yeah. what's going on around you is no longer involving your participation at all. They can acquire their own resources and whatever. But if you aren't, if you're a participant, then I think it'll remain a soft takeoff rather than a hard takeoff. Yeah, I think Marvin Minsky famously said that if you're riding the wave, there is no singularity. 
that's a really good good term. I hadn't heard that yet, and I'll try to remember that one. If you're riding the wave, then there's no singularity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because that's what allegedly he supposedly intended to do. Now, I don't know how successful he is on that front, but at least the idea I also like very much, that if you are riding that wave like a surfer, then yeah. there is no singularity at all. Yeah. That's, that, yeah, that kind of summarizes what I'm trying to say. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so, so what are the chances of uh, us surviving such an event if we don't take the active role, uh, or I mean, wh what are the chances of us taking the active role and, and being a surfer and, and surviving or not doing anything and then ended up bystanders that are yeah. left, you know, in the dustbin of history, perhaps? If we never take an active role, if we basically stay who we are and we just hope that maybe what we create takes us along, I think our chances long term are very low because, you know, I mean, how much do we really care about what's going on with ant colonies and stuff like that? It's just, it doesn't make much sense to think that we would be a very significant and somehow move on. I think our chances long term would be low, especially since long term, even our, you know, our solar system's not staying the way it is. Mm -hmm. So why would everything stay okay? Short term, that depends on the type of takeoff, on controls, on resource regulations, all sorts of stuff. Uh, I'm sure there's so many scenarios, and I really don't know what to predict. It's too confusing. Well, Rando, it's it's about time we bring our interview to an end. But before that, I have the last two questions that I traditionally ask of all my guests. And the first one is, <coughs> where can our viewers and listeners go and uh, find more about you and your work? They can certainly go to the website carboncopies.org. That's the main site from which you can find links to everything else, to our Facebook group where we do an ongoing discussions of things and events that are coming up. Um, it's also the place where we collect resources and uh, references. And that also points to things like my personal website, which is rak.minduploading.org. Um, that's the best place to start. From there, you'll find everything else. And the, the last question that I always ask is this. Do you have a single message that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from this interview today? If there's one thing that they need to take away, yeah. what would you like that to be? Okay. The most important thing to take from this is that when we talk about substrate-independent minds, and especially the approach called whole brain emulation, this is a very concrete thing. It's an actual set of scientific projects and development projects based on our current understanding of neuroscience and the engineering that we have available. It's not science fiction. This is stuff that's being worked on right now. And uh, yeah, so you should pay attention to that. That's basically my message. Fantastic. Dr. Rando Kona, thank you very much for being on Singularity One-on-One -on -one today. Thank you.